Okay, welcome to Famous When I'm Dead. I'm your host, Sam King Davis. Here we talk to artists about how they thrive while they're still alive. And today, uh, my next guest is an Australian-born oil painter living in Prague, Czech Republic. He is known for merging landscape, cityscape, and still life with physically impossible shapes. His mind-bending compositions are suddenly breathtaking and esoteric. His oil painting captures your curiosity, then draws you in like the haunting familiarity of a memory out of reach. I give you the painter of impossible, Luke Osei. I wish you had your drum kit next to you. You can do a little rim shot for that. Well, I uh, it wouldn't be a man cave without a drum kit here set up. Yeah. So that's pretty. Uh, that's actually something that I think that's really interesting about your like you and your artwork is that um, I can really see your drumming influence, like your musical influence in your paintings. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, about like how your paintings are kind of influenced by drumming and how your drumming is influenced by your painting? Wow, right. Um, hmm. <laughs> how do you see such things? You can hear the drum beats? I think so. so. You can see, yeah. see the music. Wow, that's, yeah, yeah. Well, um, from an early age as a drummer, my actual, my drum teacher gave me the advice that I should start teaching it as well. Not only to make a couple of bucks on the side, but once you have to teach something, you kind of have to know it well enough yourself. Um, so I just, I started doing that uh, back in like 1998. Whoa. And I, I found that uh, one way to teach something like music is that you've got to write it down. Uh, otherwise, you've got to record it, which is very difficult, or it was 20 years ago, with students. So you've got to write it down. You have to teach them how to read it. And I found that uh, like the little notations, the little, like the way you write music, is it's not only beautiful, but it, it's a language. And I think maybe that's what comes across in the work. Uh, somehow the notations and the phrasing of music appears in the works, something we call, yeah, phrasing. And the word composition goes hand in hand with both painting and music. So you, you compose uh, in time. Music is about composing in time. Painting is about composing in space. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So that, it's kind of uh, it's hard to describe how the two cross over. But um, yeah, imagine in a space you can divide the space into three or four components. You can then transpose that idea of three or four uh, into a drum pattern or a rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty clear in your work, like I can look at your paintings right away and see kind of, like if, if I looked at your painting and didn't know you and someone said, oh, he's a drummer, I would say, oh yeah, that makes sense. So, but, so so what I mean is like, it's, it's kind of clear visually, like how the drumming influences your painting, but how does your painting influence your drumming? Um, wow. Uh, off 
often I'm playing in jam sessions. And in a jam session, it's a lot different to just playing a song, like a three and a half minute song. A jam session can be anywhere from, you know, seven, eight, 10, 15 minutes sometimes. So you kind of, uh, you wish to keep not only the other instrumentation in for the musicians interested, but you've got an audience there, a live audience. So you really want to mesmerize them with um, dynamic changes, tempo changes, rhythmic changes, kind of textural changes in the music. Mm-hmm. That's that's what will keep people there. Uh, so does that kind of answer it? I guess it's like... Uh, I had a student come around once. Uh, I wasn't ready, actually, for him to just arrive on my doorstep. I had been partaking in some other recreational activity. At the moment. Uh, anyway, he came, and I was like, oh, Dean, you're here for your drum lesson. Uh-huh. Did, did you forget about his lesson that day? Yeah, I completely forgot. And so um, I had a piece of manuscript, like, uh, music paper so I just colored in one half of the bar line red and the other half green and then the next bar line was like a little bit of red a little bit of green a little bit of red and then, then the next one was you know all green and a little flash of red and I just said okay we're gonna play this today I'll play the red bit and <laughs> you play the green bit and of course he looked at me like uh huh. <laughs> but I said, look, if this is red, then this could be green. So you know, you just gotta improvise. You gotta run with it. Uh, that that actually going back to the jam session thing, the improvisation is a big part of that. So uh, of course, with painting and drawing, you want an element of improvisation as well. Otherwise, it becomes a bit sterile or too photographic or, um, yeah. So you just need that element of, let's say, a little dash of chaos in there amongst the order. Have you codified that? Have you codified, have you ever tried to, like, codify music with color? Or has that already been done? Oh, man. I... You can kind of see it in the works of the early modern painters, I think, with people like Paul Clay or Mon Odrian. Kandinsky. Um, yeah, yeah. They attempted it. But it tends to uh, come across as like drawing lots of little circles and vibrational things. Uh-huh. I, I, I actually um, finished a piece recently uh it's on instagram now it's a few days ago it's called uh, crimson red in minor key so i've tried to paint a jazz piece with just color and shapes so there's no i haven't used that um i'm gonna pull it up i'm gonna pull it up right now Um, yeah i haven't Try to avoid those cliches of round vibrational uh, lines or even, you know, bar uh, music, uh, you know, language. Just just using shapes, basically. Five-sided dodecahedrons. So it, it's on the screen now so people can, uh, people can see it while they're watching the interview. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's the second last piece that I put on Instagram. Oh, I have it. It's up. Yeah. 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 So this is jazz music and crimson minor. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So most, most of the colors I've chosen are what musicians might call minor notes or minor, uh, which is in opposition to major. So a lot of major songs are kind of happy. I Mm -hmm. want to play it in a, 
rockabilly band, mm -hmm. and every song was in a major key. So it had this real happy, you know, uh -huh. um, you know, uh, rockabilly kind of happy thing. Uh -huh. But yeah, I I didn't like it much. I like the minor stuff more. Yeah, yeah, you can tell by your paintings. Yeah, a little bit more evocative. And in order to get those minor tones, often what you do is choose like those deeper, darker colors, like that crimson red, for example. Uh -huh. So people, you might think red is a warm color, and it is like fire engine red, uh -huh. or, but uh, this kind of crimson is considered uh, a, a cooler color. Uh -huh. And, and uh, even that green is a cool green, the blue, it's Prussian blue, so it's like a really dark blue. I kind of just mix those three colors to get what you see in this piece. Yeah, it's got like a, a honeycomb kind of jewel, uh, like a living jewel, or like a, yeah. a jewel that's uh, like trying to become crystallized, but it can't. It still has a lot of movement to it, but it also has form too. Right, yeah. I like Both what you did there back in the corner too, like the upper left hand corner, how the it's like really crisp. There's like a crisp edge to a form yes. and then it drops off and it's like kind of blurred, so it has that depth of field. Yes, yeah. That's the landscape painter in me yeah. giving it that 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 background. It really drops back there. Um kind of like you're looking at some planet from a distance. You know, from a satellite, perhaps. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, what about the codification of it? Like, have you ever tried, what I mean is, have you ever tried to put, like, specific colors to specific notes, major and minor and all of that? I mean, you, you probably could, right? I mean, there's millions of colors and not so many notes. Exactly, yeah. Um, there are millions of variations of notes, so you start making chords, um, so, you know, a jazz head might say, okay, well, this is in C minor seven with a suspended 13 on top, you know, like, and that's just one chord. It's got like four notes in it. Um, so you could get really complicated with it. Um, I haven't tried to codify it. Uh, it's, it sounds like a really interesting. Uh, it would be an interesting way to teach also, I think. You know, especially yeah, you could you could set the kids their homework and say, okay, go listen to the bolero, and yeah, paint that just the colors in some little squares. Keep it simple, you know. That would like be a, really a cool technique, man. And then you could would. you could assign paintings for like musical projects. It's amazing. I love the idea. I mean, uh, isn't that a great idea? Like, you could just say, okay, go listen to the top 10 hits that are on, I don't know, Spotify right now, you know, the, the, the what we used to call the top 40 on the radio, you know, the popular music. And, and just, yeah, bring me back some uh, paintings in a couple of days. There you go. There's your, there's your project. I wonder how that would look, huh? Well, that, yeah, I mean, it would, it would have to be with, it definitely couldn't be with like one-on-one -on -one students necessarily. They would have to have some understanding or you would have to teach them some understanding of color and form and light and all that. So, but that's, right. that's fascinating. I would take that course. Yeah, what a great thing to work on. But then you've got the subjective thing where, you know, one, you might have a student that looks at that deep Prussian blue and she might not get that dark, moody reaction. She might say, oh, it makes me kind of, I don't know, hot. <laughs> uh, or, or, you know, it reminds me of some wonderful holiday we had on, in, on the North Sea in Gdansk. And but that's what, that's what so, makes it interesting, you know, like the different interpretations. Yeah. But I think it would probably turn out kind of sort of in the same range, you know, I mean, because... 
I think art works like music in that way, like especially colors and light and the tonal variations and like the, the tonal kind of language. Um, you know, like when I look at your work, it's you get a certain feeling, kind of like an esoteric or kind of a mysterious, curious kind of feeling. And that's because mm -hmm. of the way that you're using form and the way that you're using color. So I think that there's, you know, the same, same way you listen to a Louis Armstrong song and you feel kind of like things are going to be okay, you know? So it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I think, I think visual art has the same effect, but maybe it just gets into the emotional part of the brain in a different way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there, we have a, there is a, a bonus about being visual artists. It's not difficult to get our image across because you can hold up a picture, people can look at it. Uh, it's actually easier than playing them an entire song and you know getting them to have some reaction to that. Mm -hmm. It's so, you know, uh, uh, I think it was a sculptor who was telling me that once she worked with space and she said it's so difficult for us to, you know, to, um, to, to, to captivate an audience quickly. But you guys, visual artists, painters and photographers, printmakers, you guys can just do it in an instant. You can just hold up a picture and someone will look at it and be like, oh, wow, I don't like it or I like it. They, they get an instant. Yeah. Um, thing so yeah i see your pictures in the background there you got walter white and jesse from breaking bad that's fantastic. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's pretty interesting uh that, that's interesting about it. i never kind of never really thought of it like that i always just kind of thought of sculpture as like almost the same thing as a painting in a way in the sense of like how the audience sees it of course it has the dimensionality to it but um mm -hmm. You know, I always kind of just thought of it the same way. People kind of come upon it the same way, but I guess she's right. I think one way that you can do that as a sculptor is be a kinetic sculptor, you know? Well, she, that's what she was. She oh, was yeah. a street, uh, she would, you know, dress up in um, costumes that she would make. And so the space around her was the artwork as well. So you're, you're inviting people into a, a public space and you know you're basically asking them to kind of interpret what they're not only seeing but somehow feeling mm -hmm. the space that she brought them into. So it's hard for them to kind of monetize that, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was fascinating to meet someone who works like that, actually. Yeah. Huh. Manny Field, her name was. Manny Field. Hmm. Manny Field. Yeah. Well, let's, why don't we back up a little bit and just talk about like when you got started with art and kind of what your call to it was like what was there a singular moment or was it a series of kind of events that that made sense together and then you were like okay this is what I'm going to do like what how did you get going well it was about it was like two weeks ago I just picked up a <laughs> You just decided, okay. Well, last Wednesday at three o'clock. <laughs> Sorry, that's facetious. Um, yeah. Um, so the story in the family goes, I was a late talker, so I didn't start speaking till I was almost three. Oh, so you have like an Einstein story, huh? Wasn't that true? Einstein didn't start talking until he was four, I think. Right, right. I'm glad you're putting me in that Einstein category. I can see your uh, head inflating right now. Yeah. So that's uh, maybe I should never have to answer the critics. Anyone who you know wants to mess with me or my work, I can just say, look, I've been doing this since I, before I could talk. So. It's just natural. Um, if you want to, you know, criticize that, then good for you. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, didn't take long. My grandma used to babysit us after school when we grew up in Sydney. 
and she would always bring us um, Bugs Bunny cartoons, you know, old uh, Warner, Warner Brothers cartoons. Uh-huh. And, you know, I just started drawing characters from the screen. There was a, I think he was a Martian or something, Marvin the Martian. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I remember really that. Funny. Yeah, yeah, really, really funny. And uh, my grandma would see that and just, you know, then bring the attention to me with the other family members. So it was a good. I learned in a. I learned at a very young age that, you know, when you draw something or paint something, you can uh, create an audience. For, yeah. uh, so. Then my mom started uh, wiping paper from work. She used to work in a bank. Uh, back in the 80s, paper that went into um, photocopy machines was like, it came in these big reams, massive reams. So the paper was all connected together. You had mm-hmm. to sort of tear each sheet off. She would just grab these it, like math, like hundred meter long reams of paper, bring them home, and I would just lay them all through the house, through the hallway, and draw. I like to draw trains, especially because trains were long, so you could draw like a ten meter train through the house, and uh, yeah, that would really get people's attention. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. I I don't know if there was ever a time when I thought. Oh, I'm gonna be an artist. Even when I chose, uh, so when I was 18, chose to go to university. I actually wished to be an architect. I had even chosen for my classes in late high school to kind of direct me into architecture. So I was doing graphic design, design technology classes, um, physics. I did business studies, art. So yeah, just trying to, but, but then, you know, I didn't get in for architecture. They put me into pedagogy and uh, fine arts. So yeah. What I do you mean I for college? college? Yeah, university. Like Oh, so uh, they, based on your test results, they picked the, that for you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I must have put it somewhere on the, you know, application entrance forms that, you know, art is somehow interesting for me as well. Or, or, but man, I don't know. I did. I never decided. I don't ever remember thinking, oh yeah, I want to go to university and start learning how to become an art teacher. It was not hmm. what I chose. But I'm glad I did it. I actually failed. The first year, the, the the teaching component it was difficult. And I'd come from a rural high school, so you know I'd never even written uh, an essay or anything. So to be put into pedagogy teaching, I don't know. I, I just I flunked it. But I, I was living with a guy at the time who had been accepted into the the city's. A uh, preeminent art school, like an actual art college, mm-hmm. and I saw like the stuff he was bringing home each, uh, like each day. That was he just bringing home, like, oh, we did this and we did this, and I'm looking at it like, wow, we're not doing any of this at the university. We're just, we're just, we're just, ah. So <laughs> you just signed up for the next year, yeah, 1998, yeah. At the art school, and that was that was the best decision I ever made. Nice. Mm-hmm. So then you graduated. Did you did you go all the way with the BFA, or did you? So you got the BFA, and then. Um, that, so I why, well, so that first year of university, I just you know, uh, got out of there, went to the art college, did the three years, uh, what's it called, advanced diploma. And then that could put you back into the university system and you would get put straight into third or fourth year. I think it was third year of fine arts. So, yeah, I did a fifth year 
a university and got a degree, the Bachelor of Fine Arts. Okay. And that's where you stopped. You stopped there, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So but what happened? I also took some good advice from one of my closest teachers, the late Maisie Turner. Maisie said, look, just don't stop, you know. Okay, you're done with your studies, but don't stop, you know. If you keep this up for, say, 10 or 15 years, you're going to stop. You'll be in a place where you'll be calling the shots. You'll be able to just, you know, do whatever you want and you'll have, you'll build up your patronage and, yeah, you won't have to worry about anything. Just keep doing it. That's really good advice, actually. Maisie was her name? I like that name. Maisie. Maisie. Yes. She was... One of the best and a fantastic person, you know, like a, a teacher that you could, it was your friend as well. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could just, you could, I remember I called her up a few times just, just, just to talk. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, she was just a kind soul. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So are we still on topic here? Have yeah. I, yeah. I think so. I was just interesting, interested in what happened. Um, after that, like, so you finished with school and then what happened? Did you start teaching? Did you just keep painting or both or what? Just kept painting. Um, I think I was lucky enough to get, um, I caught the eye of local art gallerist, John Miller. He had a gallery in our city, Newcastle. And, uh, so even before I finished at the art school, I was invited to be part of a, a group show in a commercial gallery. So I kind of just, you know, I was already part of the scene before I even finished my studies. Um, and within a couple of years, I had, you know, like a solo show and... I did a bit of traveling around Australia and then a little trip, like an around the world trip. You know, I used to go into this flight center. It, it's a travel agency uh, called Flight Center. I'd go in there and just pretend that I wanted to do some trip. And I would just kind of flirt with the girls in there and say, oh, yeah, I would like to, you know, do this and go there. And they, they would take me through, like, you know, oh, then you'll be doing this and there's this option. And, and then one day I just actually went in there with some cash and laid it down on the table and said, hey, let's do this. Um, that was in 2005. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then so what city, like, did you go, what cities did you go to? What places did you go to? No, oh, I went straight to Bangkok. Ah, uh, there's a story there. Then um, Berlin, mostly Europe, like Berlin, Amsterdam. Bas I really like Barcelona. That was the whole point, you know, to, to, to go to Europe. And that was kind of my graduation from the whole art school, university thing. You got to get out of Australia at some point. You got to go to Europe and see the galleries. You know, this, know, is, interesting. this is interesting. This um, is interesting because... There's this tribal thing that happens, and stay with me because this is on topic, but there's this tribal thing that happens, and Joseph Campbell talks about this in his study of tribal communities, and when um, someone, when the boys in the village become a certain age, now with you, you're older, of course, but when, when they become a certain age, they uh, there's a, a lot of tribal communities that they'll actually take the boy away from the village and they either have them like fight the adult, the adults will wear masks and fight them as wow. if they're like gods, or sometimes they actually bury them up to their neck and then they like leave them to like, you know, enough to where they can dig themselves out, but then they have to like fight their way back to the village. So there's this, yeah. and, and what he talks about it is it's like a psychological break from your childhood, you know? And it's interesting to talk to artists and hear their stories because um, most of us have some something like that like for me my break was probably my my big break from it was probably my first trip abroad 
Um, and there's got, I guess what it is, is it's like breaking away from the mother basically. And like learning how to be a man and like survive on your own in the world. Um, yeah. So anyway, just wanted to throw that side note in there. Yeah. Some kind of initiation, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember being in Paris. I got to Paris eventually. I Were you by I yourself? Trained. Yeah, dude, I, I took a train from Munich and I was already drunk when I got on the train because I was at the one of those big beer gardens with uh-huh. the Germans and they, you know, a beer that's as big as your head. And <laughs> yeah. I, I got on the train to Paris and in the middle of the night, I'd either fallen out of my bed and vomited all over the oh. you know the floor, and the train conductor guy was prodding me with a stick to kind of clean it up, and he had to find all the other people in that cabin a new bed. So it was absolutely embarrassing. Oh wow! When I when I arrived in Paris, I got off the train, and all these people came up to me, and they're like, "Oh, you're that funny Australian guy who was." drinking with us on the train last night. I'm like, oh, wow, really? <laughs> so, um, you had a total blackout, huh? I just, yeah. So <laughs> they, uh, they kind of just grabbed me and said, where are you going? What are you doing? And they showed me, you know, a, a place to stay. And so you know, day one, I was, uh, I went to the Picasso Museum and then the Pompidou Center. Nice. Um, uh, the Picasso, like, it, yeah, I just, and like, of course, the internet at the time existed, but not in my, not for me. Everything you just did, you woke up, you kind of just went with the flow. Uh, in 2005, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had hot mail for Christ's sakes, but that was it. <laughs> um, you know, there was no just looking up, oh, what things to do in Paris. Did Google, Google uh, was around then though, right? Or, or you remember there was Ask Jeeves. You remember that one? Yeah, I think so. And then Google there bought was, that. There was a guy in the hostel. He was French Canadian. Um, the two of us just kind of, you know, you know, we hit it off and we spent time walking around Paris together and he said something like, you know, if we were walking right now and I stepped in some shit, if I was by myself, I'd be, it'd anger me, you know, just, I'd be irritated, I'd be irate. But if you were here, the two of us, and, you know, you step in the poo, then it's funny. Yeah. And I, yeah, that's really, I, I, I was, it just kind of stuck with me almost like a philosophy that, and so yeah we went to the, that's a shitty philosophy <laughs> oh i see what you did i couldn't i couldn't stop i couldn't stop myself yeah well it was good in that i got to educate him about art because he just followed me we went to you know the musee d'orsay uh, and uh you know the, the louvre and Blah blah blah. So it was good to have a friend there that you could step in the shit with. It was fantastic. <laughs> nice. Uh, mm. I so, also remember seeing back in like outside of our hostel. It's the first time I'd seen like an intellectual fight take place. There were these uh, older guys sitting at a outside bar or cafe or something. They were drinking. There was an American there, an expatriate American. Uh, he could speak French and Spanish. And there, he was being taken on by this, of course, a local Parisian guy, but also an Argentinian man. And, you know, they were talking about Chile and Argentina from the 70s, you know, Pinochet. And they were just jumping from languages, like oh, from cool. English, yeah. Spanish, to French. And I was just sitting there like, fuck like this is actually like unbelievable I, yeah I, like, yeah come, you come from a rural town in australia and then all of a sudden you're sitting on the sidewalk in paris watching a 
argument like that, it was amazing. Huh. It, was, it, it blew my mind. Yeah, and, yeah. So what next? Did you go back to Australia or? Yeah, I yeah. went back to Australia. Then, um, because I, having met uh, another Canadian traveler, he was in, uh, we met in New York in a jazz club. And then for some reason we met the next night just randomly in another jazz club. I never thought I'd see the guy again, but there he was. So we look at each other and I'm like, oh, it's you. <laughs> uh, he invited me to Japan. So a year later, 2006, I went to, to see him in Japan. He was a musician. So I arrived in Japan with a snare drum <laughs> and some gigs booked. He had booked all these concerts for us to play. Whoa. Which was, yeah. I got to awesome. sleep on floor for a month. <laughs> So uh, when did you pick up the drums? When was that? Like, what age were you? Uh, 16. Oh, really? Okay, so that was a little bit later. Uh, 16, yeah. Did you, have, uh, did you have a teacher right away or? Oh, yeah. Uh, just the friends at high school. Uh -huh. um, at that time, 1995, our great albums were dropping um, music like Tool, uh -huh. the album Anima, Anima uh -huh. had just dropped. So drummers like Danny Carey, you know, oh, Dimebag wow. Daryl, just yeah, um, yeah. So you know, I'm. We were kids, man. We were trying to emulate bands like Tool. Did you, um, did you listen to Pantera? Yes, I learned one of the double kick. Patterns, yeah. You know, the yeah. Yes. Yeah. Tool, Primus, Pantera, Faith No More, Mr. Bungle, like all this heavy stuff that seemed, it was never mainstream, but it was also not weird to have, you know, this heavy music in your arsenal. Hmm. You just don't hear it anymore. Did like, you have, you did you have musical parents or did either of your parents play music? Uh, my father played music in the sense that he often, uh, on Friday nights, he would, you know, after mum had gone to bed, he would just turn on the, he'd pull out the LPs and just turn it off, man. Like, really. I would wake up and I'd be like, wow, what is this? And go out and see my dad just, he was imagining that he was conducting Really? You know, symphony, Beethoven, and yeah, and I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Nice. He was having a good time, man. He was just there by himself. Um, and your mom was cool with that? Was she Was she sleeping okay? Yeah, I, I don't know. She never really complained about it. Oh. I guess she enjoyed it somehow. But she never really got into it. And so yeah. he would start out with, you know, the Beatles and the Stones, Pink Floyd, um, and then after a few cognacs, it would kind of merge into Beethoven, Mozart, uh, Tchaikovsky, Chopin. Wow. So I, I grew up on that, man, every Friday night for, you know, 20 years. Whoa, that's cool. So that's really where you got your love for music then, huh? It's certainly one of them. I think we were also blessed as kids. Uh, in the 80s, where basically every cartoon you watched had music in the background, like real classical music, even mm -hmm. whether it was like those Tom and Jerry things or the Bugs Bunny ones, or even the, um, all the Disney films, they had real classical uh, ensembles driving the story in the uh -huh. plot. Yeah. And I, I don't see that now, honestly. I, uh, with cartoons, I'm just like, wow, where's the music? Where's the, like I said, the, the music that drives the, the plot. Uh, so maybe that's part of it. I haven't thought about that before, but. That's so important. That's so important for film and for storytelling. You know, I was watching, man, like if you watch a movie like The Birds, 
you know, or like one of those old horror movies. Uh, oh, you mean I mean the music. Hitchcock, yeah. yeah, Hitchcock. Like it's not just Hitchcock, but a lot of a lot of older movies. Man, the music is just so bad. You know, it's like ah, who designed this? Like this movie could be actually interesting if the music was good. I, I think it's like so important for the emotional flavor of of the film. You know, mm-hmm. or just any anything that you're watching. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like um, when we did the sound check earlier, and I can see you, and I can see the screen and everything, and then the sound drops out. It feels completely unnatural to have that silence. You're just looking at this image, and there's no like, not even a hum, not even a background, not even a, a siren. Just give me something. You need sound to tell a story. Yeah. To go yeah. with that moving image. Um, yeah, that's one thing about paintings. They're kind of just, they're sort of stuck in their own little one dimensional thing. Paintings are, uh, so I guess that's maybe why you've got to kind of compose them and give them kind of edge to make it sound, to make it seem like there's a soundtrack playing while the viewer, you know, is, is taken in by your painting. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, like your career as an artist or how you've been able to uh, make a living like that? A living. Uh, a surviving. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, like I said, I was lucky enough to get picked up early as as a you know, in my early 20s by a commercial gallery. So, but I was really ambitious. I would, I would sometimes wake up at five o'clock in the morning, take a train two hours to Sydney just to capture lights across Sydney Harbor so I could paint that and just, you know, hope that one day I'd put it in, you know, some nice cafe or hotels or good. Um, where someone who could afford it could buy it. And that just came to me, you know, like I, I, I love Sydney Harbor. I grew up in Sydney. So it was, it was um, just this wonderful thing to be able to travel there just two hours away from our college town. Um, and eventually, yeah, like uh, my advice to any young artist, if you really want to, you know, start, uh, this kind of earning money thing is to go out and do it in public because every time I, every time I've done it, people give you their card, people give you their thing or they say, Hey, we've just opened a new cafe. Why don't you come, you know, bring your pieces. And, you know, the next thing you know, I, I got to meet like a famous actress mm. in Australia. She bought one of the paintings I put in a cafe in Sydney, so nice. you got to just take those opportunities, but you got to make opportunities. You have to make your own opportunities. That's good advice. Doing it in, in public for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if you want your art to be living, you have to you have to get it in front of living people. I think. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. Let me ask you a different question then. Um, what would you say the top two qualities an artist needs to master a form? Wait, let me think about that. What are the top two things an artist needs to... Wait, just ask it again, sorry. The top two, the top two qualities an artist needs to master a form. And that could be that could be painting, or it could be drumming, or it could be anything. But what what's your experience with that? Um, you mean like practice your ass off for twenty years every day? Yeah. Uh, you okay. must. You know, I have a drum kit here. It's real. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know. I 
you got to practice 40 hours a day. Okay, so that's good. That's good, that's number one. What's number two? Yeah, 40, 40 hours a day. Um, I would say something to do with what I was going on about before, making your own opportunities instead of waiting for them to drop in your lap. Mm -hmm. You've just got to be creative, even in the in a business sense. So, you know, I, I would come up with ideas sometimes and some people would just say, nah, that's, that's dumb, that's stupid, that'll never work. Um, and sometimes they were right, but, you know, often they were wrong. Uh, it, it's always about getting the work out so that people can see it. It's no use having it sitting around in your studio forever. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you've gotten a lot of your, you've been able to sustain not only your artistic growth, but also financially, I guess, with teaching. Yeah. That's another big part of your professional artist career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, teaching, painting, drawing. Uh, I, I like to teach people, you know, they have to start somewhere. So what I like to do on the first lesson is I set a timer for two minutes and I do a demonstration just on normal paper as well. Nothing special. Just, you know, here's a pencil, here's the paper, you know, so it's not something unusual to them. Mm -hmm. They know what it is. I even asked the question, kind of funny. Uh, you, you guys know what this is, right? It's a pencil and this is paper. And then I'll, I'll just draw an object that's sitting on the table and, you know, get them to time you two minutes, bang, bang, bang. Okay, this is how I do it. I want to get it onto the, you know, onto the piece of paper. Uh, I, I will start here. I'll move down there. Don't worry about details. Let's just get the form, the essence, la, 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 la. Okay, time's up. And so then I set it for them. And after they've done their little two or three minute sketch, I do something that they're not expecting. I reduce the time down to about 45 seconds, like half the time. Mm -hmm. And they look at me like, are you kidding? Uh, no. Three, two, one, go. And, and they're drawing the same object? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, they do it and... Okay, so now they're done. We have a look at them. Everyone has a little bit, you know, a bit of a laugh, but it's awkward. And I'm like, look, don't worry about it. We'll do another one. Okay, now you got like 20 seconds. Yeah. Here we go. And then, you know, then they really get into it. because they, they, you know, they start to really move. The next one, 15 seconds. Now you got like 10 seconds. And then we go all the way down, five seconds. We, we the, the funniest one is the one second drawings because the countdown is longer than the, the yeah. duration. So I'm like, okay, guys, three, two, one, go, stop. <laughs> <laughs> And so, of course, it looks like a scribble mess, and that's great, because so does mine. And, you know, I'm a teacher, and mine's meant to look exceptional. I guess, that, I guess that kind of teaches them also that it's not, about, it's not about the skill so much as it is, like, the dedication to something. Like, there's a famous quote by Einstein that, uh, that's on my mind recently, and he said that... Um, he said, all you, you, you people think I'm so smart and I'm not, I'm not any smarter than you. I just stick with the problem longer. Stick with the problem longer. Yes. So he, wow. he's able to like, you know, I guess he's able to, you know, his theory of relativity, he's able to stay with it for 10 or 20 years. And then, you know, eventually something happens, you know, where he, he solves it, you know? So, right. and that's the thing, like for me, when I see a painting, I used to be impressed by the image. But now I'm more impressed with like, when I see the image, I'm like, oh, I'm impressed with the time it took for that person to learn and practice over decades to be able to create that image in a, you know, 10 hour time frame or whatever time frame. 
I'm not, I, I, you know, of course the image is compelling, you know, but now I'm impressed with the work that goes into it. You know, I'm impressed with a yeah. person's like persistence, you know? Yeah. And I would add to that, that the general public can see how much work goes in. They might not be able to, you know, guesstimate it down to the nearest hour, but they can certainly say, hi, hey, my four-year-old can do better than this. And I think that's what they're getting at when they make a comment such as that. Because, um, you know, you, you've heard that a million times. Oh, my three-year-old daughter can do better than this. And I think that's kind of what they're getting at. It's, it's the, the artist is... Uh, um, it's like they're making a mockery of it or a joke of it by splashing some paint at a canvas and, say, and then signing it and saying, here... This is fine art. Give me a hundred thousand euros. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that they they can see that not a lot of discipline went into it. Yeah. 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 And what was that quote I saw recently? Bad art is still art. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, if I took a piano now and just started smashing the keys randomly and then grabbed a saxophone and just, you know, started playing it out my nose, like, is that, that's music, really? Yeah. You would buy that? You would listen to that? <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I would definitely, I feel you on that. I The school that I went to was very much... Very much like that. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, it has to have the hand in it. You know, it has to have the dedication. It has to have the, the really love for it. On the other hand, there are people that make really great work that are kind of untrained. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, there's a guy, Wilford Wood. He's a UK based sculpture sculptor. And he, uh, he, he did get training. I don't know how far along he went, but he makes these really like, quirky kind of fun sculptures but they're they're like caricatures but they're kind of fine art too but you look at them and they feel really like homegrown and but th but the thing is is like he's using some core principles you know it's not just a you know a banana taped to a wall or something um so um i want to ask you who your three biggest artistic influences are and why? Now they don't all have to be artistic influence. They can be just influences in life. But who are those three? Or who's the first one you can think of? Oh, um, I would say the Australian painter and fantastic illustrator drawer, uh, Brett Whiteley. Brett Whiteley. That's the whitest um, name I've ever heard. Brett Whiteley. <laughs> yeah, um, I his stories that like he was bored in church one day, and he he reached down under the you know the chair or the pew or whatever it's called, and he discovered a Van Gogh sketchbook. Really? And that just yeah. What do you mean, like just, just a book of his sketches? You mean? Or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and okay, okay. He was just, it just, you know, and, and you can see it in Brett Whiteley's work. He's drawing and he's, he's, his illustrations and the way it then turns into the paintings. Like, his paintings are almost like drawings rather than paintings. You, mm. You've got to see it. And I, I saw that, the freshness of that approach from Brett Whiteley's um, brushwork. Like, he's really into that. Um, you know, the, like the ink on paper, this, you know, kind of oriental flavor. Can you say oriental? Um, yeah, so Brett Wiley is one of them, and of course, Van Gogh. Um, I'd say the music of people like Frank Zappa and Miles Davis is a big influence on both my paintings and musical tastes and stylings and techniques and methods and compositions. Um, man, I could rattle off names all day. Um, 
Myself. I inspire myself. <laughs> My God. Man. Ah, well, you know, that's good. <laughs> that's good to be inspired mm-hmm. by your own work. Yeah. So I'm gonna give Look you I... I'm gonna give you some uh, rapid fire questions here. And uh, okay. I we'll have we'll meet again and we'll like hang out again and next time we'll talk more about your paintings I guess and um, just uh, I'd like I I want you to tell the Bangkok story because I love that story. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely hang out. We'll we'll do some more for sure. Um, but I want to keep this one wrapped up to the. I'm gonna try to keep it close to an hour. Yeah. So good. here's your rapid fire questions. Ready? Stand-up or skit comedy? Stand-up. What's, you're on death row, what's your last meal? Oh, maybe that powdered protein stuff, you know? Really? Really powdered? I'm just staring at a jar of it right now. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, what book are you reading or what show are you watching right now? Oh, boy. Um, I'm actually reading uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life uh, TV shows. Oh, I don't know. I've been kind of rehashing over the, this mini series called Chernobyl. Oh, man. It's so good. Yeah. Disaster in Chernobyl. It's fantastic. It's perfect in this COVID hours and days yeah. and months. Yeah. To see the cost of lies. All right. What artists do listeners need to look at? What artists are do the fans or the people watching, who should they look up? Well, don't take the initiative and think for a second that maybe Brett Wiley would be a good one to start with. Good answer. Favorite color or color combination? Uh, A minor with a suspended C minor (laughs) seven. (laughs) Oh, I don't know. Red and green. Okay. It's it's, it's that time of year, isn't it? Favorite new band or musician? Oh, man. I think his name is Thunder, Thundercat. Thundercat does this kind of hip hop stuff with a modern progressive edge to it. He's also inspired by Zapper, in fact. He's a bass player, fantastic singer, bass player. Thundercat, the okay. album is called Drunk. And every song, there's 49 songs and it's 49 minutes long. Oh, so, that's interesting. So it's like the songs are short and Bitey, they catch you. Like, that's amazing. Thundercat, huh. drunk. That sounds cool. It's, uh, do, you know the Tiger Lilies, they came out with the album COVID-19? Did you see that? I haven't known. Oh, okay. Do you know the Tiger Lilies? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think they have COVID-19-1 and COVID-19-2. They have two albums they came out with. Okay, uh, aside from COVID, what is pissing you off right now? What's getting your goat? You have that expression in Australia? What? What's getting your goat? Mm, I mean, I think we do. We'd probably replace it with a wombat or a kidna <laughs> or, a, what's, or a kangaroo or something. What's, I no what's pumping here, your wombat? We would just say straight up, it's fucking pissing me off um it's, i don't know people like mitch mcconnell that <laughs> we won't go there um 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 people who are against wearing masks uh what else um oh you only need to answer one lucas we don't need your whole bag of <laughs> And all that, all that bad art that's good. <laughs> yeah. Bad. <laughs> bad, bad, good. Mitch McConnell. Did you see the drawing I did of Mitch McConnell? It's on my Instagram. Does he look like a turtle's scrotum? I hope so. You just have to look at it. Ooh. Okay. If you had a billion dollars, what would you do with it? Ooh. 
uh, probably do my best to alleviate myself of at least 999 million of it and just keep a million. I don't think no human needs a billion dollars. But what would you do with the extra? That's that's why I posed the question. How much fun and it would be giving away that much money. Like you could go find this NGO who really needs it. You could go talk to these guys who are cleaning up the oceans or you know, you could you would actually have a great time going around figuring out how to spend it. It would be amazing. You could go go see a bunch of artists in some squat somewhere and just say, Oh wow, like you, you would really meet it would give your life um, some real purpose to just give away, you know, a billion dollars. It would be amazing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and it's an extraordinary amount. You know, like if you think about one million seconds, it's about two weeks, I think. But a billion seconds, have a guess. How, it, what is it? It's like 3,000 years or something like that? Yeah, 32 years. Oh, okay. 32 years. 32 wow. years C- compared to two weeks. Wow. It, it, it's an extraordinary difference. Whoa. Um, and then you think about someone like Jeff Bezos, who's got like 200 billions. It turns out to be like 6,400 years compared to two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, next question. Okay. Hi, Grandma. <laughs> You're trapped on an island. What book would you bring? It could be an album also. It could be anything, but what book would you bring? Uh, a sketchbook. Ah, good answer. One nugget of wisdom for young people today. Uh, nugget. Could be a saying, could be a saying, could be advice, could be a quote, could be an analogy. I'd say this, at least once a week or once a month, that's usually what I do, um, go for a long walk, find a bridge, go to the middle of the bridge, and then scream really loud, like just no one's there. No one's going to hear you. Don't worry about it. Just go out into the center of a bridge and just, and it doesn't have to be an aggressive thing. It can be just a hoop or a holler, like just something. Cause you'll, you'll see what happens. If you, you'll walk away smiling. What's that? What, what are you doing there? Are you releasing some of that primal, primal tension? Are you, uh, mm-hmm. Expressing your freedom? Yeah, it's a bunch of those things. And you'll definitely laugh. Just see how ridiculous the sound is when you're out there by yourself. It's like, it's a surreal experience that you've just created for yourself. Cool. That's my advice. Yeah. There's way too many stories to fit into an hour, so we'll definitely do it again next next time. We'll share some more stories. I want you to be my my Duncan Trussell, be my my Duncan Trussell guy. Yeah. Yeah, buddy, I would love to do that. Oh, well, actually, I'd recommend anybody out there to go watch Duncan Trussell's Netflix special called The Midnight Gospel. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. Um, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm into. That mm. that crazy animation where it doesn't necessarily tell the story of what you're hearing. So yeah. you're listening to I watched yeah. it a couple of times. That's the thing for me. It's like it's a twists my brain up, you know? It's like I'm watching mm-hmm. It's like the emotions don't sync with like what's being said. The the visual emotions aren't matching what's being said. What's being said. Why do you, and why, we're so, yeah, we're so used to it. And he, they've just gone and smashed that whole idea. Yeah, I, that's why I, I don't think I went back to it. I watched a couple of them, but uh, I like the animation. 
I like the podcast or what, what's being talked about, but I don't like them together. <laughs> I would say um, maybe just skip to the last one, episode eight, because he's talking to his mom and it's very moving. Mm. Um, she passed away not long after that discussion mm. and to see it animated and uh, it's really powerful. Mm, you can okay. skip the whole, you don't need to see the episode before, just go to number eight, Midnight Gospel. Mm. So we might have to wrap it up, my friends. I have to get out of here because they're going to lock me in. Oh, yeah, perfect. To... Okay. Any last famous last words before you go? Famous last words. <laughs> famous last word. Uh, that's one small step for mankind. One giant leap, or blah, 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 blah. Have you ever noticed at the end of that quote, it gets all muffled? You can't really hear. No, I don't. No, no. Listen to it again, that, that moon landing thing. Lucas, hey, last, everybody. The last word is, is scrambled. It's muffled. You don't hear it. I can't hear it. It's mankind. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For mankind. <laughs> mankind. <laughs> <laughs> all right brother we'll talk soon get out of there before right, they lock man. you in yes all right. all right bye see you all again